Dave. Hack on Triple J. Yeah, huge news there, and we'll make sure that we keep in touch with Rachel. Hack. No guns! No guns in the wrong remote community. We don't want no guns! Enough! It's enough! On Triple J. On Friday, the news came through that the jury in one of the most significant murder trials in Australian history had reached a verdict. NT policeman Constable Zachary Rolfe was found not guilty of murdering Aboriginal man Kumanjai Walker, who Rolfe shot during an attempted arrest in 2019. The verdicts led to an outpouring of grief and anger from Kumanjai Walker's family, First Nations communities and Walpuri elders who are calling for a change to police practices in Indigenous communities, including getting rid of guns. It's a conversation that's been happening for a while, so could it happen? With me to discuss this is Terry Goldsworthy. He's a criminologist and a former detective. Terry, thanks very much for coming on Hack. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Are we seeing more police shootings in Australia? And when I say that, I mean police shooting at people as as opposed to police being shot. Yeah, look, uh, we did have a spike in 2019-20 where we had about 16 shootings, but it has since in the last round of data that came out, it's gone back down to six. So we travel on average about each year six uh, shootings where police fatally shoot someone per year. So it, it has returned to where the status quo was. Uh, is there a rise in any particular part of the country? Is it different depending on where you are? Yeah, look, there's no uh, real patterns in terms of geography of the shootings. I mean, obviously the states with the bigger populations are, are represented more. Um, but what we do know, we compare well uh, to places like the US uh, where there's substantial differences in culture in terms of the gun culture and the way policing is conducted. So... Um, you know, if we look at uh, the UK, for instance, and compare to that, uh, we have a similar level of uh, police shootings to the UK, even though they have a population that's twice our size. But there are some uh, intricacies around uh, the UN model, uh, U- sorry, the UK model, where they have armed response units and they're geographically uh, in a much tighter framework than we are here in Australia. We might get onto that in a bit. Um, we are, are we, well, I wanted to ask, are we seeing a change in the way police are operating? Like I've seen that you've written before about police becoming more enforcement orientated. What do you mean by that? Yeah, it's a term we call police militarisation. It's where, you know, civilian police um, increasingly draw from and I guess model themselves around the doctrines of militarism and military models. So, some of those areas where we may see that tangible evidence of it is things like equipment, organisational, cultural and operational indicators. Uh, if you look at the US, they have a system where they allow uh, police to access surplus military equipment. We don't have that uh, same facility here. The government does provide funding for some, uh, I guess you could call military equipment like Bearcats, which are armoured vehicles. Uh, but the US, it's, it's far greater, that interaction between the police and military in terms of equipment. Uh, for instance, I think one uh, journal article I was looking at when I was writing a chapter recently uh, talked about 12,000 bayonets being issued to the police in the US. Now, of course, you would wonder what the police would be doing with bayonets. That's crazy, really, to to hear about that. Um, what we're seeing now, and we've been hearing it for a while, are calls for police not to carry guns in remote communities. There are other countries in the world where police don't carry guns, right? Mm. Yeah, look, that's correct. Um, but I think, you know, you, it, it's, it's good to make those calls, but you've got to look at the overall context. And, you know, one of the things, some of the things that, you know, I looked at when I was looking at, you know, our response in terms of firearms is, you know, what threats do our police face in society? And let's, you know, on, we have to be honest, the policing is a dangerous occupation. We have a number of police killed every year in Australia. But, um, you know, things like the war on terror, the, you know, the enforcement of drug laws, uh, you know, the level of violent crime are all issues that, you know, you need to look at before you can just carte blanche and say, let's remove firearms. Um, the other issue is, too, people often misunderstand or don't understand the role of a taser, which is a non-lethal or less than lethal uh, option. Um, and they people go, well, why can't you taser someone when they got a knife? Well, once someone gets within seven metres of you, roughly, uh, they're going to get to you before you can draw your firearm. So a taser has an effective range of three and a half metres, uh, the ones that we use anyway in, the, in Australia. So taser is really not an effective option because if you don't get a good deployment, 
the person with the knife will be on you before you can withdraw your firearm out of its holster. So there's a bit of a fallacy there about, uh, you know, if there's a knife, just tase them. It's, it's not that simple. You talked a bit about the UK model before. What What is that in, in, in the UK? Yeah, well, generally they operate on, uh, you know, having um, armed response units, so heavily armed police. The general police aren't armed. Uh, and they have a number of those units circulating who can respond uh, if police uh, require assistance. And look, it seems to be reasonably effective over there. There have been exceptions. For example, uh, there was two policemen who turned up to domestic violence matter and were killed by an offender who was waiting to ambush them uh, because they were unarmed. There are some exceptions to it. But, I mean, they're different to us in that, you know, the problem with the call to remove firearms for a uh, remote community is that if someone there was armed with an axe and the police had no firearms and the person began to attack them, it would literally take hours to get some armed response to them. So that's uh, vastly different to the, the effects or the operation that you will see in places like London, for instance, where, you know, an armed unit might only be a matter of minutes away. All right, Dr. Terry Goldsworthy, very much appreciate you coming on Hack. Thanks, Dave. Hack on Triple J. And that's all we've got time for on the Hack podcast for now. I'll catch you next time.